If you look on the chart, you find there are these two elements that are particularly interesting. One of them is called uranium. It's found in nature. There it is. Element number 92. So that means it has 92 electrons. Uranium has this, again, think of a flea, think of a, uh, a flea or a mosquito in the midst of Memorial Stadium. And there's the nucleus. It has 92 protons. It's uranium-238. What that means, with 238, that's called the atomic weight. Now, all the weight is in the neutrons and in the protons. But if you subtract 92 from this, you find 6 and then 4, 146 neutrons. So it has that many protons, that many neutrons. The neutrons have no electric charge, but they serve as a glue. At the same time, you put too many of them in there, or you don't put them in the right place, and the nucleus can become radioactive. This is radioactive. Uranium-238 is radioactive with a, with a half-life of, uh, actually, I forget. It's billions of years. I do remember uranium-235. Let's look at uranium-235. What's the difference? It's still uranium. That means it still has 92 electrons. It's still uranium. That means it still has 92 protons. These little mosquito-like things in the center that have all of the mass. A proton weighs about 2,000 times as much as an electron. So an electron is there. It does have some mass, but it's really tiny. 92 protons. So, it, but it has three fewer neutrons. That's 143 neutrons. Turns out uranium-235 is radioactive. It has a half-life of about a billion years. Go back to the beginning of the solar system, and there was lots of this stuff. It was abundant. And then it started decaying. After one billion years, there was only one half as much. After another billion years, only half of that. After another billion years, only half of that. After another billion years, only half of that. And here we are. And so it turns out that uranium-235 is about 0.7% of your ordinary uranium, just because it's mostly decayed away. This is decayed away, too, but it has a longer half-life, so not much of it is gone. So these are called different isotopes. And we can say, here's one isotope of uranium, here's another. This one is a rare isotope, not really rare, 0.7%. That's not tiny rare. It's enough there so you can do something with it. Then there's another element. This is one called plutonium. It's over here. It's done in light colors. That's because it, it doesn't exist naturally. Plutonium-239 is a very interesting one. There's another one, plutonium-238, which is actually harder to make. This one has a half-life of 24,000 years. Plutonium-238, which has one less neutron, has a property that its half-life is 80 years. Not only that, but its radioactive decay is alpha particles. Alpha particles are really nice. See, they don't even get through your skin as long as you don't breathe them in. And so plutonium-238 is produced in a special way, and it, we used it in our probe that was launched just a couple weeks ago to go to Pluto. Why? Because it decays so rapidly that it has lots of energy. It heats it up, gets very hot. You can turn that heat Someone called a thermocouple into electricity. So the power to broadcast back when you're way away in Pluto, it takes 10 years to get there. This stuff will still be producing a couple hundred watts of electricity so it can broadcast things back. Really nice for space. It used to be illegal. Why was it illegal? Because it was plutonium. And plutonium was considered really super dangerous by the public, even though the experts knew it was quite safe. And so laws were passed, you cannot use this kind of stuff, can't send it into space, what if it crashes, and so on. There was a lot of, I think, harm done by the fact that people's fear of plutonium meant that people would pass laws making it illegal, when in fact it was really quite harmless. Fortunately, we're beyond that now, and this plutonium is being used. But these are the famous ones, uranium-235 and plutonium-239. This has a half-life of about a billion years. But they both share a property 
that is key to the rest of this lecture. And that's the following. Suppose you have a neutron coming from somewhere. You can make a neutron. There are several ways to make a neutron. One favorite way is to take something that's radioactive and produce alpha particles. So we have a bunch here of atoms. You have a little bit of uh, pol polonium-210 or something like this. It, it's radioactive, and alphas come out. Now you put a little beryllium next to it. And it turns out that when an alpha particle hits a beryllium nucleus, a neutron shoots out. So boom, out comes a neutron. This is a way of making neutrons. It's actually a very convenient way. And you'll see one of the atomic bomb designs, I, uh, b atomic bomb design I will show you, has a little thing in the middle to make neutrons to make the bomb work. And all it does is it takes the alpha particles and a little beryllium, and they're sitting there, happy as can be. The alphas are coming out. They don't go very far. And you bring these things together, and suddenly the alphas hit the beryllium, out come neutrons. So you can make neutrons that way. You're not making them. You're releasing them from the nucleus. The alpha particle bangs into the beryllium, and out comes a, nucle a, a, a neutron. If that neutron comes to uranium and hits the nucleus, if it stick to the nucleus, certain probability it will stick. If it does that, we no longer have uranium-235. We have uranium-236. Now, here's the key feature of uranium-236. It becomes highly radioactive. Its half-life, um, the, the number is probably less than a billionth of a second. I don't, I don't remember what the number is. And it doesn't just give off an alpha particle. It explodes with something called fission. The nucleus breaks into two pieces, and they go flying apart. They're repelling each other. Once it breaks, once that nuclear force is broken by that extra neutron going in just the wrong place, the two sides break apart, and we get these two pieces flying out. The pieces that come flying out are called fission fragments. Now, you take any nucleus and break it up into two random pieces, and the odds are those fission fragments will be radioactive. And in fact, most fission fragments are radioactive. That's called the nuclear debris or the nuclear waste. But anyway, a neutron comes in here. It, it doesn't smash it apart. This thing is almost coming apart anyway. It's held together by the nuclear forces. That neutron comes in there and just unbalances those nuclear forces in such a way that this thing flies apart immediately into two pieces. But if you just break up a nucleus, the pieces are probably radioactive, and most of them are, and this stuff is bad. It leads to two things. One is nuclear fallout, the other is nuclear waste. So these are two issues that are going to be coming up over and over again in these lectures. But that's where they come from. Plutonium, the same way. What happens is if a neutron hits this, by the way, it's not easy to get a neutron to hit the nucleus. Think of it. It's like shooting a bullet into Memorial Stadium and trying to hit that mosquito. Most of the time, you miss. But when you do hit, the mosquito breaks up, releases enormous energy, and you get two fission fragments. Fission fragments, radioactive debris, that's very dangerous. Leads to nuclear waste and nuclear fallout. Now, here's the discovery that makes this thing suddenly Exciting, fearsome, dangerous, useful. Not only do you get two fission fragments coming about, but on average from the uranium, you get two neutrons coming out too. Plutonium. You get three neutrons coming out on average. When this was discovered, it was seen as the key to the chain reaction. A chain reaction is, well, you got this thing, and you send one neutron in, you can get the neutron from beryllium. This thing fissions, out come two neutrons. Ah, suppose you put enough uranium around here. Well, you have to put a lot, because it misses most of the nuclei, right? So if I just have one next to it, it'll probably miss. It's like hitting a mosquito in Memorial Stadium. So you put more and more and more and more, and you put enough of them in there so that it's likely to hit. If you do that, that's called a critical mass. A critical mass is when you put enough material there that it's likely to hit. 